Today we're talking about the Word in John chapter 1, and we're answering the question, was the Word God or was the Word a God? Hey everyone, welcome to The Pursuit with James Griffin. My name is Mike Anthony, and I'm the discipleship pastor here at Cross Point City Church. And I'm here with our lead pastor, James Griffin. And James, I just gotta tell you, we, we've hit a milestone okay. in the podcast. All right, All right, what is that? We have gone international. No. So I got some feedback okay. from our producer, Ricky, and he, <laughs> we can see where people are listening from. All right. right? And there was a person now, granted, just we've, one, just one. Okay, we've got some mission trips out, so they could right. have been on a layover. But I'm going to choose to believe that it was a German citizen that was listening <laughs> to the pursuit uh. with James Griffin. Uh, but we're seeing people accessing and listening to podcasts as far away as California. Yeah. So coast to coast, we're starting to see some interaction, which has been pretty cool. And Germany. And Germany. To the one person in Germany, thanks for listening. So we are internationally known. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, All right. So enough of that nonsense. I like Um, it. Let's jump into what we're talking about today. So this past Sunday, we started our John series, right? And we talked about last week, we're going to be there for the foreseeable future. It's going to be a while. Right? Yep. We're going to move through it very slowly and very deliberately, which is a good thing. That's right. Um, So... So today we're talking about um, John 1, 1 through 5. Right. Right. The Word was with God and the yeah. Word was God. Right? right. So this is like the this this foundational truth that I believe John is um, dealing with first. Yep. And I don't believe accidentally. Yeah. Right. Um, so let's, let's jump into it. Okay. And if you could, let's just do um, a quick recap like we did last okay. week. You know, just kind of let's get caught back up to speed. Maybe if someone missed some of it or didn't catch it on Sunday. Easy enough. Easy enough. No, and I, I agree with you, Mike. I mean, John is starting where he starts on purpose for a purpose. Uh, this portion of the book that we're in, it's actually verses 1 through 18. is known as the prologue of the book, the introduction. Yeah. So he's really just setting it all up. Uh, laying the groundwork for what he's going to do throughout the rest of the book. And I love it. He just comes out swinging, man, (laughs) holding nothing back. So uh, I would love to give the recap. I'm just going to read the text again. John says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And so I'll just touch on a few things. Uh, obviously, John starts in the beginning, yeah. which takes us back to the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis 1-1. We see that same phrase, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he's telling us that Jesus was there yeah. when that happened. The word, the logos, the divine self-expression or speech, right? Christ came into the world to speak of God, to reveal God. And in the beginning, he was there. Yeah. Uh, not part of creation, but present at creation. That's a very important truth to hold on to. It's going to matter in just a few minutes when we talk about yeah. the question for today. Sure. But he was there. And, and John tells us that he was with God. And that idea of being with God means that the Son and the Father were in relationship before the beginning of all things. And we can even add the Spirit into that. Yeah. And so this is the three members of the Godhead, the Trinity, uh, that John is referring to here. As Christians, we believe in one God expressed in three persons. Mm-hmm. You know, I address this heresy on uh, Thursday and Sunday, modalism, yeah. which teaches one God who has expressed himself as different persons. You know, that God was Father at one point, and he changed forms and became the Son, and yeah. changed forms and became the Spirit. That is unbiblical nonsense, okay? Mm-hmm. You don't need to buy that. Uh, But the truth is one God eternally expressed in three persons, Mm -hmm. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They have distinct roles and responsibilities, but they share the same nature and character, which makes them one God. And I joked over the weekend too, it's like, if that makes your head hurt, that's good, it should, (laughs) because we're talking about the infinite God of the universe and and we can't get our our little finite brains around him. Um, But then he also goes on and he says, and I love this, that the word was God. And this is John's whole purpose in writing his gospel, yeah. to prove Jesus Christ as the Son of God, so that guys like you and me, uh, all you listeners out there, might believe in him and receive life in his name. Yeah. And so John holds nothing back, man. Jesus wasn't some religious teacher. He wasn't just another leader or prophet. 
Jesus was God mm-hmm. and he is God, the eternal son of, uh, the eternal son of God. Yeah. And, uh, and in him, he goes on to say, is life. In him is life. And that starts with creation. I love the point that he makes, and he makes the same point in Revelation 3. John does. He wrote that book as well, uh, that he created all things, and without him, there was nothing that, uh, nothing that was made would have been made. And so all creation finds its beginnings in Jesus, yeah. which is fascinating. You know, Mike, you and I wouldn't be sitting here right now talking if it weren't for him. <laughs> you know, in, in yeah. Christ, we live and move and have our being. Uh, we exist through him. And so he is the originator of creation, the agent of creation. God made all things through the son. And so he, he says too that, he's, he, uh, that in him is life. And I, I made the point over the weekend that this means three things, that he's the giver of physical life. Mm-hmm. And so that means all life matters. I won't re-preach that portion of the sermon. <laughs> I could, but, yeah. but all life matters because yeah. it comes from him. He's also the giver of abundant life. So if you wanna know extraordinary life, life to the full, only Jesus can give it to you. Mm -hmm. And he's also the giver of eternal life. Um, God gives us eternal life and that life is found in his son, 1 John 5, 11. And so we need that because we're all spiritually dead apart from him. And as spiritually dead people, we can't do anything to give ourselves life. Mm -hmm. Uh, Can't bring ourselves back from spiritual death. And so in that way, we're hopeless. We, We need the life that Jesus Christ offers. And I love where John closes in verse five, that life he offers, uh, uh, it's the light of men. And then he says that the light shines in the darkness and the darkness hasn't overcome it. Yeah. And so Jesus Christ is the one who leads broken people out of darkness, mm-hmm. right? We know the world's a dark place, not because God designed it that way, but because sin has resulted in darkness. Yeah. The darkness is with us because sin is with us and we weren't designed to live in that, which is why Jesus came to deliver us out of it. Yeah. John 12, 46, I came into the world as light uh, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Mm-hmm. And so praise God that he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And he has also left us here to now be lights in this dark world. Yeah. Uh, if we know him, we're called to live lives that dispel darkness. It's why in Matthew five fourteen he calls us the light of the world. Uh, we are here to illuminate the darkness for what it is, to live lives that attract people to the great light that is Jesus, yeah. and ultimately to promote the life that is found in him. Yeah. So again, the challenge to all the believers in the room over the weekend was, don't you dare waste your life by aiding the darkness, right? <laughs> yeah. uh, be, be a light in this mm-hmm. dark world. And to those who haven't yet believed, come out of the darkness and receive life from the one who can give it to you. Yeah. So that's a brief recap. I think I I think I got it all. That was pretty good. I think I got it all. That was pretty good. All right. So I, I, I love that um, the imagery of light and dark. Yeah. Right. And you see it, it a lot in John's writings. You see it a lot. Right. Right. You know, it's not like a. It's not like oh wow, I've never heard that before. You, you know, yeah. if you've been in church for five minutes, you've probably heard it. Right. Uh, but we were talking about this. You know, when we were getting ready, like we we're writing the group curriculum and stuff like this, and um, you know, that that phrase, the dark darkness cannot overcome. Yes. Right. And we was like, well. There is, it is impossible for it to be so dark that a light won't work. Right, that's right. Right, so yep. you flip a light on, it doesn't matter how big or how small, if you're in a dark room, it is going to affect the environment. That's right. Uh, and I think that's intentional. I think that's why he's using that illustration because there's literally no way that a light will not work. That's right, the light always wins. Right. It always wins and praise God for the end of the book, right? We yeah. know that in the end, the light wins. We win, Yeah. Jesus wins. And for eternity, we will be with him in a world where darkness is no more. It's a That's powerful That's really image. good news. Yeah. Yep. Yep. All right. So you got in a little trouble on Thursday. Yes. You got, went, got my hand slapped a you, bit. You went a little bit over. Just, yeah, <laughs> like, I don't know, seven, eight minutes, something like that. Blew my preaching time out of the water. Yeah. Uh, now, some would argue <laughs> that this would be a good reason to go on Thursday nights. Yeah, man, if you, you want it all. You get some bonus content. That's you know, right. you're trying some things out. You know, it gets kind of exciting on Thursday nights. It does. You should come check it out. My yes. favorite gathering of the week, man. If you haven't been, you should come. But that, what that means, though, is if you only came on Sunday, there yeah. was some... There was some stuff that had to get cut. Yeah, that's right. Right. So let's let's get everybody kind of okay. back on the same page. Help right. us kind of walk us through um, real quick what you had to cut for okay. Thursday. Yeah, I probably cut out uh, about five minutes or so from yeah. the sermon, and so. And you didn't yeah. really get in trouble. No, for being silly. no. Yeah. I didn't get. In the, they they gave me the option of cutting some 
sermon length or or cutting a song, and I didn't want to do that to our worship team. And the worship was just so good. It's like yeah. I'll just I'll cut some fluff, but <laughs> but I think the fluff matters, you yeah. know. I mean, I had it in there for a reason, so yeah, right. I'll, I'll hit some of it. Um, really, it all fell under the portion of the sermon where I was talking about Jesus being the Word, mm-hmm. that He is the Logos, right? That's the Greek word there for Word, the divine self-expression or speech. And you know, I made the point that that we as people, when we want to express ourselves, that's the most common way we do it is through our words. Right. We we speak. And also said that we need to be really careful with our words. And so one of the things I did not talk about on Sunday was this James 3 reference, mm-hmm. um, where James talks about this little muscle in our mouths, the yeah. tongue. Yep. And man, it can be a force for good, but it can also be a force for destruction. Mm-hmm. You know, James, he actually compares it to a bit in a horse's mouth, a rudder on a ship, and yeah. then a spark that can set a fire ablaze. Mm-hmm. And so it's a picture of power, right? This is a powerful little thing. Yeah. And it can be used for very good purposes, or you can literally tear people apart with it. You know, Proverbs 18, 21 says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. And so you can build people up or you can straight tear people down. And and I think we gotta be careful in the way that we express ourselves, yeah. how we use our words. So anyway, that's just a little nugget for you. But but God, same is true for God. Throughout history, he has always expressed himself by his word. Mm-hmm. And in the New Testament, yeah. the word is Jesus, right. the Logos. And so I made the point that him being the word means that he is the expression of God's character. Um, he came to reveal certain things about God. And this is where I'll get into some of the other content. You know, I had a lot of misconceptions about God growing up. Mm-hmm. In, in the church I grew up in, and I don't know if it, it was anybody's fault but mine, but yeah. but I did. I had this really warped view of God. Um, you know, I was the kid who thought God cared enough to keep me out of hell, but he didn't like me very much, you know? <laughs> and, and I thought of him yeah. as this slave driver, mm-hmm. this being that was always angry at me, this being that I was supposed to work to please and appease so that he would stay off my back. Yeah. And so for years, man, my relationship with God was really, really messed up because my view of him was off. Mm-hmm. And maybe you're listening and that's how you think about God. And, and here's what I'd say. That's not who he is. Right. And Jesus proves it. Mm-hmm. He expresses the character of God. If you want to know who he is, you need to read the gospels because that's who God is. Jesus is God. Right. Um, but then there's also people, and maybe this is true for some of you, who think, oh, God is love, so he doesn't care what I do. Yeah. And I'm just telling you, that ain't who he is. And that's a really dumb way to think, if I can just say that lovingly, right? Like, yeah. Love doesn't let people do whatever they want. <laughs> I mean, Mike, we're both dads. We get this. Yes. Like, you, you love yes. your daughters, right? Very much. So you just let them do whatever they want. Of course. Play in the street. <laughs> Here are the car keys. Take the yeah. matches. Burn Here, the house down. play with down. this knife. Cook some dinner. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, I just love them. So I let them do what they want. Come on, man, we all know that's not true love. Love sets boundaries, love seeks to protect. Mm -hmm. And so again, Jesus reveals the same to be true about God. Um, If you read the gospels, you see the character of God in Jesus. And and so I would say to you, if you wanna know what God is like, just look to him. Um, I'll keep going. Jesus also reveals God's way of life. And so I made the point on Thursday night that if you wanna know how to live in the world, look at how Jesus lived. Yeah. That is the life God created you and saved you to live. And so if you're trying to figure out, well, how do I spend my life and what do I do with my time and how do I treat people and how do I spend money and how do I, right? Yeah. Look at Jesus and do what he did. And here's an important note. You can't do what he did on your own. Right. You're not just going to work hard at it (laughs) and get it right. This is not a matter of determination. Right. The Holy Spirit of God who lives in you, if you're a child of God, he is the one who empowers you to live that life. Right. You can't live like Jesus apart from the Holy Spirit. And so doing what Jesus did and living like Jesus lived, this is a matter of you yielding each and every day to the Spirit of God, walking in step with him so that you are empowered to do what Christ did while he was here. Yeah. He reveals God's way of life. And, and that way of life, by the way, leads to joy and contentment and satisfaction. And so if that's what you need, that's the life you need to live. Um, I said he reveals God's heart towards sinners. I love this. In the gospels, Jesus was accused of being a friend of sinners, Mike. Yeah. And do you know why? 
Because he was a friend of sinners. Because he was. <laughs> ding, 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 right? Mike is batting a thousand. But, but he was. And, and man, I just love this about Christ. You read the gospels and you see him hanging out with the outcasts, with the tax collectors, with the women who had been pushed out of society for promiscuity. I mean, you, you just, you find him hanging out with these people that people were shocked that he'd be hanging out with. Like, what is he doing with them? Yeah. And so the religious leaders condemned Jesus for it. But when you see his heart, he, he was loving and kind and patient and gracious towards sinful people. Why? Because God desires sinners to come to repentance and faith in Christ. And Romans 2, 4 says, it is his kindness that leads to repentance. Yeah. And so praise God for that because we wouldn't be sitting here right now if it weren't true. Like if, right. if that was in his heart toward guys like us, we would be hopeless. And then finally, I talked about how Jesus reveals his heart toward the self-righteous. Mm -hmm. uh, Matthew 23, here's some homework for you if you're listening and you were here on Thursday. Go read Matthew 23 and see what Jesus said to the self-righteous of his day. Yeah. These were the Pharisees, the religious people who thought they were honoring God, but really they were dishonoring God. Um, thought they were doing God a service by, by casting certain people out, but in reality, they were hurting people that God really cared about and loved. And Jesus just rebukes them, man. Yeah. Goes after them, calls them hypocrites, blind guides, children of hell and whitewashed tombs. On the outside, you look fantastic, but on the inside, you are full of death. Yeah. And that is not the kind of stuff you want Jesus saying to you, right? It doesn't sound like it'd be very it, uplifting. It doesn't. Yeah. And so I, I would say if you are seeking righteousness apart from Jesus Christ, you are the self-righteous person that Jesus is rebuking. Mm -hmm. And so righteousness is found in him and in him alone. All right. So all of you people that missed Thursday, I think. I think that should catch you we're up. That's up. the content that you missed. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully that helps. So we're talking about the word. Yes. So the question that got submitted this week okay. um, really sparked a lot of interest for me. And it's really kind of sent me down a bunch of rabbit holes <laughs> <laughs> like the last day and a half. It's like, man, that's really interesting. I didn't know that. And I started digging and digging and digging. Uh, so let me let me just read what got submitted, and then we're going to yeah. kind of break this down into two okay. um, different questions. So uh, Jehovah's Witness translation of Scripture, the New World Translation, right, says the word was a God, yes, not the word was God. So John, that's the question, yeah, yeah. John one. That's the question yeah. we're answering today. Is our version of Scripture says the word was God? Yes, theirs says the word was a God. Correct. So how do we interact with a Jehovah's Witness yeah. based on that? Understanding the, important, the importance of the deity of Christ being foundational to everything. Yep. We get that wrong, we get everything else wrong. That's right. Right? So how do we interact? So first, let's talk about the New World Translation. Okay. Uh, like how it came to be, like... yeah. And then really just, I think we also need to discuss just translations in general. Yeah, yeah. Because there are lots of different translations of scripture. So, you know, how do we know right, right. which one we should be reading and yep. which one, you know, all of these things. So I'll just kind of toss that up. Okay. I mean, that, that's really specific, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I love that. And, and I did address Islam... Jehovah Witnesses mm -hmm. and and Mormons. Uh, that's in probably the sermon. why he asked the question. Yeah, which is why I assume we got the question that yeah. we did. Uh, but each of those religions and belief systems are fundamentally different than Christianity. Yeah, they are not the same. Mm -hmm. They're not, and and it just boils down to the simple fact of who is Jesus. Yeah, as Christians, we believe he is God, the eternal Son of God. Muslims don't believe that. Jehovah Witnesses don't believe that. Mormons don't believe that like we believe that. Mm -hmm. And so I think this is a really, really important question. I love that someone asked it. Yeah. We could probably spend hours on this, but we don't have hours. So <laughs> let, let's get into it. So Mike, you want to talk first about the New World Translation, right? Yes. Okay. All right. Here is how I would answer the question about that translation. Um, it is a wacky translation. Yes. It, it is. Mm -hmm. And honestly, it is not true to the biblical text. I will talk more about that in just a moment. But when you read the New World Translation, what you find is the people who translated it, the, the founding members, if you will, of mm -hmm. this belief system, Jehovah Witnesses, those who translated it, 
they bent the translation of the Bible to fit their preconceived notions about God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Okay, yeah. an important thing to note about Jehovah Witnesses, they deny the reality of the Trinity. Very openly. Very openly. Yeah. This is actually another heresy called Arianism mm -hmm. that denies the divine nature of Jesus Christ. He's not equal to God the Father. He's not the same as God the Father. Um, in terms of nature and characteristics, all that's not inherent to him. Mm -hmm. and, and so this heresy was actually condemned at a council called Nicaea back in 325 AD. And so the church has, has viewed this as heresy for many, many years now. A while. Yet the yeah. Jehovah Witnesses fully embrace it mm -hmm. um, and fail to acknowledge that what they believe was condemned a long time ago. But again, they deny the Trinity. Um, in some of my research, I found that they even say that this concept of the Trinity originated with Satan himself, yeah. and they chalk it up to paganism. So again, what they believe is very, very different than what we believe. They believe that God created Jesus, that God created the Spirit. So there was a time when who they would call Jehovah, God the Father, existed all by his lonesome. Yeah. Um, and and it was only a matter of time before he created these other beings, but they do deny the Trinity. And so again, when it comes to this translation, what they have done is bent the Bible to fit that narrative, right. to fit those preconceived assumptions. And so let me talk for a moment about Bible translations because it's important that you pick the right one, obviously. <laughs> but when you study Bible translations, what you find, few different types. Uh, there are word-for-word -word translations, so examples of word for word, ESV, mm -hmm. uh, that's what I preach from, English Standard Version. It's yep. what I preach from on a weekly basis, do most of my study in. King James Version, word for word, uh, NASB, New American Standard Bible, word for word. And so the goal of these translations is to get as close as possible to the Greek and Hebrew manuscripts, okay? Right. The Old Testament was originally recorded in Hebrew. The New Testament was originally recorded in Greek. Mm -hmm. We have thousands and thousands of manuscripts that are mostly the same. I mean, if, if there are any variances, it is in small little minute details that do not impact the overall meaning right. of the text. And so right. the reliability is incredible. Mm -hmm. And so when translating a word for word, the goal is let's get it as close to that as possible. Right. So every little word is taken into consideration. Then there are thought for thought translations. So a great example, the NIV, which I really enjoy reading the New International mm -hmm. Version, another, the NLT, yeah. the New Living Translation. And so uh, thought for thought, is that what I said? Did I say word for word yeah. again? No, you said thought, thought for thought. Okay, I did. Okay, yep. it starts late in the day, man. I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> thought for thought translation. <laughs> and so again, the, the idea is we're going to take the thought that's being communicated and we're going to translate it so that people can understand that thought in modern language. Right. Again, the goal is accuracy. Mm -hmm. And then finally, there's paraphrase. And a great example of this, probably the most common known paraphrase yeah. is the message. Eugene right. Peterson, you know, took the Bible and rewrote it in modern language. And so, you know, if you want to read it, that's fine. Just know it's not nearly as accurate as the others. Probably not the best to be studying. Yeah, and probably not the best <laughs> to be preaching from, right? So anyway, that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> But as I said a moment ago, the goal is to start with the original manuscripts and the translators of, of these uh, translations I just mentioned, notice the language, translators. These yeah. are large groups of people, usually with DRs before their name mm -hmm. or PhDs after their name. Uh, they've studied language. They are versed yeah. in linguistics. These are highly educated people that are doing this together to yeah. make sure that they are doing it accurately and appropriately. Sometimes hundreds, like we're not talking about five or six, we're talking right. about hundreds of scholarly right. people working on this That's thing. exactly right. Yep. Okay, not so with the New World Translation. Right. Not the case, right? Um, Mike, I think you said it earlier today, we were talking about this, four guys, yeah, so four guys four. translated the New World Translation. And, and how educated were they, Mike? So, Three of them had zero training in biblical languages, linguistics, right. anything. They had zero training. Right. Three out of the four. That's 75%, um, by the way, if you're bad at math. Right. So yeah. one of the guys um, had you know what this article called a rudimentary understanding of biblical Greek, Yeah. was self-taught in yeah. Hebrew, and had no understanding of Aramaic whatsoever. 
So right. the reality is, is any you know, what what has kind of come to light. Anybody that if you even look past this kind of surface level thing is there wasn't enough of them. Yeah, and the ones that were doing it didn't even come close to the expertise necessary to try to translate. You know. Biblical Greek, yeah. Koine Greek, and yeah. the Greek that you speak in Greece today are two different languages. Right. They don't work. Right. Right. So you have to have an understanding of biblical Greek. Yes. And then don't even get me started on Hebrew. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Dots and squiggles and yeah, all that yeah. kind of stuff. You mean reading right to left yeah. instead of left to right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, so these yeah. guys had, um, they had absolutely no technical ability to do what they were setting out to do. And, you know, and I'm speculating now, so I'm just going on okay. the record. This is speculation. Yep. I don't believe they looked at the original manuscripts at all. Yeah. I think they took an English translation of the Bible and yeah. they changed the words that they needed to change. To, um, to fit the narrative. Right. And you, you may be very right because here, here's the reality. When you go back to the Greek manuscript and you read John 1.1, 1, 1, mm -hmm they completely ignored the grammar contained there right. in the Greek. Well, because they didn't okay. understand it. They didn't understand <laughs> it. They added the A-N, yeah. which again, they failed to do just five verses later. We'll right. talk about chapter one, verse six this week in the sermon where it says there was a man sent from God. This is John the Baptist. Yeah. Well, why didn't they say there was a man sent from a God? because the grammar in both verses is exactly the same, <laughs> yet in the opening verse, they added the yeah. A, right, to right. fit the narrative, and then further down, they left the A out because it didn't really fit the narrative. You see what I'm saying? Right. And so it's a wacky translation, mm -hmm. translated by guys who had no business doing it, and they translate it to fit what we as Christians would deem complete heresy. Right. And so please, 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 whatever you do, don't be picking that up and reading it. <laughs> it's it dangerous. Is, it is a dangerous yes. translation for sure. So I think anytime, and this is not new to man. Man has consistently tried to change the word of God to fit yeah. their worldview, their theological view. You know, and we talked about this a little bit last week about like desiring this God of our own making. Yeah, yeah. So... We've we've talked a lot too about just this idea when we approach scripture, we bend to scripture. That's right. Not vice versa. That's right. So when we find something in scripture that we don't like, yep. or I don't want to do that, it, it, it's me that needs to change, not the word of God. Bro, I love that. that. That's right. We come under the text. Yeah. The text does not come under us, right? We right. submit to it. Um, it does not submit to us. And, and unfortunately, in the case of the Jehovah Witnesses, yeah. they submitted the text to themselves. And that's probably what is most sad yeah. it is. about it. It is. Because when you think about, and we were talking about this a little bit before we started recording, just the dedication of the typical Jehovah's Witness. Yeah. Right. How, how they've dedicated themselves to study. Yeah. And like getting in conversations with them, you better be prepared because they know it. They do. Right? Yeah. Uh, but they have dedicated and devoted themselves to a lie. That's right. It yeah. is, um, at best, it's an incomplete gospel. At yep. worst, it is a lie that's sending people to hell. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, you're exactly right, which I, I think is a good jump into the next part of the question, Mike. You're kind of leading us yeah. there. So yeah. what do we do yeah. when we encounter someone who believes this and yeah. says, well, my Bible says right, right. Jesus isn't God. Right, yep. He's a God. He was probably pretty powerful, right? but he's not God. Yeah. Well, I, I think a little background on Jehovah Witnesses and the movement as a whole might help. Yeah. Because I, I think you need to know some things about what they believe, where it all came from, um, so that you can approach the conversation in the right way. And so I'm going to give just like cliff note version history lesson sure. if I can. Yeah. Uh, but the founder of, of the Jehovah Witness movement was a guy named Charles Taze Russell. And he actually grew up in the Presbyterian church, which mm -hmm. is interesting, uh, but he had some real problems with some doctrines like predestination and eternal damnation. And so the dude just decided, well, I'll create my own thing. <laughs> and so he did. You sure he wasn't an American? Yeah, yeah I know, right? I'll just, <laughs> yep, yep, I'll figure it out and, and I'll, I'll form something new. And so in 1877, he actually worked with a guy and they published this, this work together declaring that Christ had already made his return to planet Earth. It was an invisible return. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you why in just a moment. 
And uh, he also predicted that in 1914, just 40 years later, that the great battle of Armageddon would t- take place and the world would end. Well, clearly none of that happened because yeah. here we are today. Yeah. And uh, so failed prophecy, number one. Mm-hmm. Well, not long after that, he, he launched what is now known as the Watchtower Magazine. Yeah. Anybody who's familiar with Jehovah Witnesses, you've probably heard of the Watchtower Magazine. And uh, he also wrote another work called Studies in the Scriptures. There were six volumes, and he talked a lot about Christ's invisible return, the end of the world, the coming of God's kingdom. It was around the same time that they moved their headquarters to Brooklyn, New York. Mm -hmm. And so here's this guy, man. I mean, he's just devout. He's preaching. He's writing. he's, he's, He's... like gathering followers, but he also came under a lot of scrutiny. Yeah. Um, at one point, he actually stood trial, and under sworn oath, this guy declared that he could read biblical Greek, so we're, we're kind of going back to that again. Yeah. And somebody handed him a Greek New Testament, and he couldn't read a single word. That's problematic. On trial when yeah. this happened, very problematic. And so he admitted that he lied about it, and he lied about a lot of things. Um, this was a guy who, after his prediction didn't come to pass in 1914. Um, He predicted that in 1918, God would destroy churches and church members by the millions, said that human governments would be destroyed by 2020. And then he also predicted again that the end of the world would come in 1925. And none of that happened. (laughs) And surprisingly, his followers just kept adjusting all of the info that he was feeding them and others to make up for all of these failed promises. Their so math was off. The, the math was off, you know, something, <laughs> yeah. But uh, but it's interesting yeah. to know that this is the guy who started this movement. Mm-hmm. Uh, I even read that at one point, his wife divorced him because of his conceit, his egotism, and his interactions, like inappropriate interactions sure. with other women. Yeah. And so this is the guy that started the whole Jehovah Witness movement. Now, uh, moving on, I, I said earlier that Jehovah Witnesses completely deny the Trinitarian nature of God. Mm -hmm. Uh, They believe that there is one God who created Jesus the Son and and, uh, God the Holy Spirit, who's not God like like God the Father is God. And again, it's been condemned as heresy. And this whole a God versus God thing that we talked about as it concerns Jesus, there's even another aspect of this, okay? So they believe that before Jesus came into the world and lived his earthly life, that he was an archangel. Right. That he was Michael, the archangel. Okay, this is really, really strange stuff. Yeah. Um, Hebrews 2 talks about Jesus being greater than the angels mm-hmm. and that God has never called an angel son. Right. That God has never called an angel to come sit at his right hand in this position of authority and this position of honor, yet he did all that with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Uh, We also know from the scriptures that Jesus created all things and angels are not eternal beings. They are finite beings like like human beings. Mm -hmm. And so that means Jesus created the angels. So how could he be an angel and also create the angel? (laughs) It's problematic. It's it's very, very problematic. And so... In his pre-incarnate life, they think he was Michael the archangel, okay. and that then he was born into the world and took on human flesh. They deny his bodily resurrection. This is so important, yeah. like, because everything we believe as Christians hangs on the resurrection of Jesus. Right. They deny his bodily resurrection. Instead, they believe God the Father recreated him as a spirit being. So think about it. He went from Michael the archangel. Yeah to human man, to recreated spirit being. And so right now in eternity, Jesus Christ is not in a resurrected glorified body seated on the throne of heaven at the right hand of God the Father. He's a spirit being in eternity, which goes back to this whole invisible return of Jesus thing, right? Right. This is why he's coming back in an invisible manner. He doesn't have a body, so he can't come visibly. And then furthermore, they also deny the substitutionary death of Jesus Christ. Wow. They do not believe in substitutionary atonement, that Christ died in our place for our sins and that we are saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. They still believe that salvation comes through works, Mm -hmm. that that reward comes through works. And those works are all laid out by the guys who founded this whole thing. Jehovah Witness, they do not believe what we believe. Yeah. It is completely different from Christianity and I know the language at times sounds a bit the same, but it is not the same. 
And so um, let me give you some advice on how to handle it, okay? Yeah. Number one, I would say you need to be really prayerful. Mm-hmm. If you encounter someone who believes all of this, you need to be really prayerful Yeah, uh, that God would give you the words that you need, the, the heart, the attitude that you need, and that God would open their hearts to actually hear the truth. Right. Because Mike, as you said, a lot of these people are so bought into this and they probably don't even realize the error of their ways. So you mm-hmm. need to be prayerful. You need to be humble. Mm-hmm. Like the goal is not to take all of this information I'm feeding you and, and go destroy people with it. Smash you know? somebody with it. <laughs> I want you to know what they believe so that you can understand the danger of this movement. Yeah. And it is not the same as Christianity. And so be humble, like, mm-hmm. like embrace the conversation in a way that lets the other person know that you actually care about them as a person, yeah. right? We don't win arguments, we win people. Right. So be humble about it. I would also say, say, stay focused on the scriptures. Mm-hmm. The more you can take people back to the scriptures. No, 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 he was God, not yeah. a God, he was God. No, he wasn't Michael the archangel, right? Yeah. Um, he made the angels. He's different from the angels. If you can keep going back to the scriptures, bodily resurrection, substitutionary death, yeah. then you can start to have conversations about what is actually true. And then when it's all said and done, you just have to trust God to reveal the truth to that person. Mm-hmm. You can't do that, only he can do that. Yeah. You're a messenger, you deliver the news, and then you leave the results in God's hands. So that's what I would say. Yeah, I th- so just to build on some of that too, I think that... Um, when I was thinking through, okay, well, how would I do this if it was me? Yeah. Uh, I think your heart, like the humility you spoke to, yep. the power of the Holy Spirit, all these things, and your heart have to be in the right place. Absolutely. Because so many times, and you, know, you see this in uh, apologetics specifically, Yeah. right? You know, you get really excited about it, and then it's like, okay, I got all this knowledge, I'm gonna put my gloves on and I'm gonna go find a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon or you know, right, whatever, right. or an atheist. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go argue it and I'm gonna right. smash them yep. with this yep. information. It is, right. there's no way you're getting out of this, right? right? Um, in which case, what you really become, you just, you get a lot of theology, but you're still just a jerk. That's right. Right? Yeah. So you're gonna keep, and you're not going to convince anybody of anything. You're just going to be fighting, and yeah. eventually you're going to start losing some testimony. Yeah, yeah. Um, so making sure that your heart um, is in the right place. And I just did um, just a cursory search yeah. of how to interact with Jehovah's Witness yep. um, about the deity of Christ specifically, right? Uh, and I found a ton of information because mm-hmm. th- this is a very common thing, and there's been a ton of people that have written articles about this because this is like the foundational truth for the Jehovah's Witness that right. Jesus is not God. Yeah. I even went to their website and very easily found a section that said, in a bold heading, Jesus is not God. It's very clear. Right, they're not hiding it. They're not being right. sneaky about any of that stuff. Uh, but I found this one guy that talked about... Um, like trying to get into an argument with them about translations yeah. is it's like beating right. your head against the wall. Right, right. You're never going to convince them their translation's yeah. wrong because they teach them. And I, again, I found some really weird stuff. Yeah. Uh, but you know, they they will even verbalize like the inerrancy of scripture. Correct. Infallibility. All this stuff, like everything like you would hear. And you're like, well, that sounds right. But but their scripture, the new but world translation. But their scripture, yes. right? They believe that if it was not produced by the watchtower, yes, that it is wicked, right, and evil and sinful and all these things. Yep. Um, and even so, the watchtower publications even get to the point where they're superseding scripture. Yeah, yeah. So using their version of scripture to prove the deity of Christ, because we've already talked about there's four guys. Yeah that took this on, yep. but they didn't really do a very good job of it. <laughs> uh, so the best example I found, and there were several examples, but for sake of time, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna pull up one okay. where he talks about John 1.1. 1, 1. Yeah. They said the word was a God, yeah. but they didn't account for John 1.3. So reading from the New World Translation, mm-hmm. Uh, and then using some basic logic, it says, all things came into existence through him. And apart from him, not even one thing came into existence. Yeah. So logically, there are created <laughs> beings. Right. And they are non-created beings. 
right? So God is a non-created being. Yeah. He's always been. There's never been a point of creation. He always has been. He always will be. Yep. Non-created being. Created beings, that's us. Yeah. Animals, fish, cats, dogs, you know, created. This verse clearly says in their translation, it says, apart from him, not even one thing came into existence. So that means that nothing happened right. until him. So he wasn't created. He is, he was, that, he is one thing. <laughs> he he is fall, the one thing. He would fall into the category of one thing, yes. Right. So therefore, he cannot be a created being. Right. He has to be God. That's right. Um, That's so really good. These are just... And again, I came across several examples um, where using their translation of Scripture yep. and still proving the deity of Christ right. was kind of the overwhelming response from a lot of these articles that I was reading that, you know, using the ESV or whatever is going to be a waste of time. Yeah. They're yeah. not going to hear it. Yeah. Now, and again, you know, we're saying also apart from the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit can use whatever he wants. Right. Um, but that would be my um, recommendation is, you know, do one of these searches like, hey, how can I prove the deity of Christ yeah. using the New World Translation? Um, and, and, if then, you, and if you want more info, just email Mike at <laughs> Mike A at CrossPoint, at Cross Point and he'll send you all his links, right? I'll send them all to you. I think that's great. I've been I combing through them for about 12 hours. <laughs> <laughs> hey, can I, I'll just add one more thing before we wrap it up. I, I think too, as I sit here and I listen, Mike, um, to what you're sharing, I think you also have to be really patient with the conversation yeah. because this is probably not a conversation. Mm -hmm. This is probably many yes. conversations. And and you got to commit to this for the long haul yeah. and just be okay with that. Yeah. And so don't don't get impatient and don't get frustrated or discouraged. I would say have have the conversation in a way that leaves the door open yeah. for the conversation to continue. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's really good. Um, so I think that what we can definitively say yes. to the answer to the question, the word is God. Amen. And I think that's a pretty good place to end it. Yep. So we're going to wrap it up right there. Um, but we will be back next week. We're continuing on in our John series. We'll be tackling um, it's six through 13, six through 13 um, next week. Um, so as you're listening to the sermon, as you're thinking of questions, uh, please share those questions with us. We'll have a social media post that goes out uh, kind of prompting you to submit questions to the sermon. We would love to hear um, really how you're kind of wrestling with yeah, some yeah. of this and unpacking some of the truth, the questions that come to mind. This was a great question yes, it today. Was. And I, I'll have to say, I, I kind of nerded out over it a little <laughs> bit. It was a lot of fun to answer. Uh, but please submit those questions. But no, uh, until next week, know that we're here for you and we love you.